All right, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm joined by a legend of the game, Keith Wireless, man. How you doing, sir? How you doing? <laughs> How did you pronounce that? <laughs> I, I, I thought I got it right. I couldn't say it quietly, so I didn't put it. You pronounce it. You pronounce it in the way that, uh, like the, the the money none of us get. You know, bonus. Bonus. <laughs> we I don't get a bonus. I yeah. thought it was uh, Spanish. <laughs> it's actually it stems from Norway. Um, so you actually pronounced it the correct way, but my family's always pronounced it bonus for whatever reason. But you actually oh. pronounced it the correct way. So, okay. Yeah. So well done. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, Thank great, you. great to see you, Clint. You're right. I knew, man. I knew, man. How you been doing during this, this whole year? In fact, not just this lockdown, but this year. Whoa, where do you start with that? Um, it has been tough. Um, and I lost a lost a, a very close family member and uh, and, a, and, a, and a good friend during that process. Um, but health wise, ourselves, myself, and 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 the missus have been okay. I mean, she's had to work all the way through it. She works as a a DDO at Lewisham um, for the Met, so she's had to work all the way through. So it was a, a going back. Just before COVID started, she was moaning at me about I was doing too much work, never mm. at home, always out 24-7. Got to give something up. After being two weeks in lockdown, she said, go and do what you like. Yeah. <laughs> take on any jobs you want to take on, just don't be in the house. <laughs> so, uh, Anything to get you out, yeah? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and it wasn't difficult to do. I mean, I've been fortunate enough to to be involved in an educational uh, role and working back with the uh, Charlton Athletic Women's team yeah. um, as, a, as an assistant and kind of a backup to the management team there. So they've obviously carried on through this latest one. So I've been able to keep busy and always, all the way through it, this the technology now, the webinars and the different stuff. And I've, I've also, um, I'm on the LMA management diploma this year as well. So that's involved a lot of, Stuck in front of the computer stuff, um, which all of us are used to now. I think. Yeah, I know. It's it's this is like the new norm, as they say, right? Just being in front of the, the laptop and for everything, whether it be speaking to people, whether it be watching a TV, whether it be webinars, it, it is the new norm now. Just to be communicating like this face to face. It seems that way, and it seems that um, you know, even the FA education programs have obviously realised how much they can get across in that way mm. so watch this space on, on when the new courses are designed how much is going to be much more is going to be online because they now know they can get success from that i just hope it it doesn't replace too much of the time on the grass because that's still where you know certainly in coach education side of it it's certainly where the, the best work can be seen and done so hopefully it doesn't replace too much there's there's still still got to be a good balance of that no, of course, of course. Um, Keith, I wanted to talk to you about obviously some of your experiences, man, because obviously you've been you've been around a bit to say the least, did it? To, to put it nicely, I mean, two to Mitchum, Charlton, you said Millwall, Estonia as well. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to talk about you know some of your experiences, maybe like starting with your first experience into um, into coaching, really. Well, I've, I've done this on blogs, and it, it goes back a very very long way but um i think i said it on on the, the soccer social event it my coaching career actually started when i was still playing i was an 18 year old 17 18 year old at, at school and part of a successful schools team mm. and and that team wanted to stay together when when we left school so it was like right you're the oldest you're the gaffer you're the manager you're the coach so it was yeah that's how it started um I'd always kind of been recognised at school as being a potential teacher and the staff always run at me there, the teacher run at me, you should do this, you should do that. But I didn't really want to go into teaching in the classroom. It was more, if it was about sport, then yeah, I would have jumped at it. I was, I played every sport going at school, tennis, hockey, rugby, football, whatever I could play, volleyball, anything I could play, I, I wanted to play. And, and then a lot of those, um, I was also like captain of whichever team it was. Mm. Um so always kind of, if you like, trying to take the lead. Um, not in a, <laughs> in a, a I'm going to say a, a dominant sort of way, but just it, 
the competitiveness always, always grabbed me and, and I was always wanting to compete, whether it be an individual sport or a team sport, but more so the team sports. Yeah. Um, so from then on, it kind of went on through different areas, and, but I didn't actually do a coaching award until I actually quit playing. So I was playing semi-pro down in, down in where I came from, Stevenage, neck of the woods. Yeah. And I came up to London, really giving up playing. Um, and I, I actually took a pub down near the Walworth Road off the Old Kent Road. Mm -hmm. But within a very short space of time being in that pub, it was like, oh, we go over the park for a kickabout over Burgess Park. So 20, 30 lads over the park having a kickabout. Then it's, can we form a team? So we formed a team in the pub, joined the old London Sunday League, then became the Met Sunday League. Mm. Uh, and while I was doing that, advert in the South London press was preliminary award coaching badge with Millwall FC community scheme, mm -hmm. uh, 12 quid. So, oh, <laughs> wow, 12 quid. Yeah, I'll have some of that. And that yeah, you're getting a week. 12 nowadays. <laughs> well, no, no, no. It was too good to turn down. I mean, I didn't know the ins and outs then, but it was, uh, it was a week course, six-day course then. That was it, down at Southwark Park on the old yeah. carpet AstroTurf. Mm. And I had Les Reed as one of my tutors and a, and a guy called Nicky Milo, God rest him. And... Um, and we did the full six days there, which at that point included doing three topics, um, a, a technical practice, a skill practice, and the old 636, and a written exam at the end of it as well on the last day. Um, and you passed or failed at the end of that week. And that was the, that was what was then replaced later time by the level two, by the, the certificate. Yeah. So I passed that. And while I was on that, um, got chatting to Les Reed, and he just said, you're, you're kind of a natural. This is it. Have you considered going further and I was still playing then obviously I was playing with the team I, I joined a club called Keyworth in in the South London Alliance as well on Saturdays while I was down here still wanted to keep playing and uh, yeah I managed I think about a year and a half later to get on what was then the FA Advanced Award it wasn't the UEFA Award anyway it was the FA Advanced at Lillishaw for two weeks yeah uh, I don't know how I got on it but I got on it and I think obviously Les gave me a recommendation and I can't remember how much that cost me. It was around about a thousand, over just over a thousand then, I think. Mm. But I went up to Lillishaw. I remember driving up to Lillishaw and pulled into the car park in my battered old transit van. Um, <laughs> and all the merch started coming in and the Range Rovers and everything else. And, and, and the likes of Peter Reed got out, Jerry Armstrong, Tony Curry, yeah. uh, Alan Irvin, to name but a few. And I'm like, um, uh, <laughs> what, what am I doing here? And uh, and to be fair, it was a two-week, obviously intensive course, very intensive course up there back then. It was the old um, Charles Hughes course, um, and it was very, very intensive, physically and mentally. Um, but obviously, I was playing amongst those players, even in in the practices. And but I'd had a, a an ACL problem, so I was in a lot of pain. I was popping painkillers for fun. Uh, and I struggled with that one. I, you know, I can't lie. Um, it was fantastic to take part in sessions and, and have a go at coaching those guys. Uh, the one that stands out for me, I was doing a, an 8v8 shooting session and Peter Reed skied one over the bar and I'm giving it the old stop stand still. Uh, <laughs> and, Peter Reed, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A Mar a Martin Hunter was one of the tutors and he said to me, he's an England international, tell him. So I'm like, Pete, come on, mate. No problem, whack, no problem. Give us a ball, pinged it in the top corner. Yeah, yeah that's much better. Thanks. Uh, but uh, and then then it went on from there really. And he was fantastic, Peter Reed. He was he took part in every single session. Everybody asked for players. He was the first one to step up. Mm. But again, I have very clear memories of his first ever coaching terminology. So when he took his session, compared to the way we think we should take the sessions or we're taught to take the sessions. His first line was get a cigar out of your ass and do this. So <laughs> along those lines. So yeah. sorry for the accent if there's any scouts listening. So, <laughs> but yeah, get a cigar out of your ass. So that was his first coaching point. And I heard a lot of those kind of terminologies when I was involved in, in teaching pros on courses because they had their ways. Yeah. Uh, I, I'll give another quick one. I did a prelim badge with the PFA uh, for Millwall when it was, Ben Thatcher, Keith Stevens, players like that, Mark yep. Bertram. And Keith Stevens did a 1v1 defending session with a young uh, a young scholar, Wally, his name was. I always remember he said 1v1. He said, Wally, I want you to lay it into him 
And I want you to pin it him. Pin blast. <laughs> F and hit him. <laughs> and I'm like, well, Keith, Keith, come here, mate. <laughs> said, you can't, you can't say that. Well, that's what I do. I you know it's what you do. <laughs> Don't worry what would you coach them. But um, that, you know, you had to kind of adapt to that and uh, and almost accept it to a point, but obviously give them some guidance. Yeah. And and again, that was again that was still the old preliminary award. So, and slightly different for the pros as it was to to us. But yeah, I've got some some real great memories of the whole process. But obviously, I came from a a non pro background in that sense, so I had some daunting times as well. That you know you would class as stressful and uh, intimidating. But I have to say that in the main, the pros were fantastic. Mm. Uh, you know, they weren't overlording it. They weren't looking down on you. Um, you know, I actually kept in touch with one or two even after that for quite a while. And it resulted as I went on in in kind of knowing how to form good relationships with the pro players. And when I was at Charlton and still a tutor and, and I, I was doing UA for Bs, then for the Surrey FA, um, you know, Chris Powell and Dean Kiley both chose to come and do a B licence with me rather than doing it through the PFA. Wow. Because they wanted to see how it was for the other guys. They didn't want that, what was then the fast track system. They wanted to come and do it the way that, that grassroots lads and amateur lads, semi-pro lads were doing it. And uh, they, were, uh, they were amazing on the course. Mm. Absolutely amazing on the course. And to have them on there as well for the other lads, you know, and, and them talking to the other lads and, and telling them that what, you know, what they were doing was as good as anything they do and, and so on. It was, it was brilliant. And again, both of them have remained good friends ever since. No, that's awesome, man. And to hear those stories as well, especially that one about Peter Reid as well, it's, it's awesome to hear, man. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, again, you know, you get you kind of got a lot of mixed messages back then. And I think one one thing that was on one of my feedbacks is you used to get like a an A, B, C, D, E, F grading on yeah. that course. And it said if you got Cs or Ds, you had no chance. If you've got a C or a D on your sheet, you had no chance of actually passing it that year. Mm. Um and I didn't pass it that year. Um, I actually went back two years later to get it. Um, but yeah, I remember the eleven v eleven. I had I had defending in the in the middle third in eleven v eleven, and I had again quite a few old pros. And I had Paul Goddard in the game as well. He had mm. just been bought by uh, Millwall from West Ham for about eight hundred grand at the time, which is peanuts now. But um, yeah. he got he got nutmeg by a fifty six year old guy from Rotherham. <laughs> um, and but he still remembers it to this day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if, if I, but previously, I'd been told in my sheet that I needed to lighten up. I needed to be a little bit more um, humorous because I was uptight and I was nervous, obviously. And they just said, relax and try and smile more and, and have a little bit of jokes with the, with the players sometimes. So I've gone, bloody hell, Paul Mills just paid 800 grand for you and you're getting nuts by 56. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, obviously... Uh, Everyone else was like giggling and shoulders were going up and down. And I thought, oh, that's all right. And he just looked at me, Paul Goddard. And, um, but after the game, they'd written on my sheet, do not antagonise the players. And I'm like, oh, that's you got to win. <laughs> got to win. Okay. Yeah. So I wasn't too impressed. But, uh, I actually reacted quite badly at the time. And uh, But Les Reed was on that course. He wasn't my actual tutor then, but he was on it. And he kind of come over to me and took me aside and went, calm down. Calm down, don't say anything because you, you might not get back on the course if you do what you look like you want to do. So <laughs> I said, okay. <laughs> and I left it at that. Um, oh, yeah. I didn't get it that year, but I learned so much that uh, I was really keen to get back on it again. And, and I managed to get on two years later and, and I flew it the second time because I used all that experience that I'd gained. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and sometimes it is about that. It's about kind of taught me that you don't don't jump in at the deep end go and get the experience and then yeah. that can guide you through it a lot easier if that makes yeah. sense thousand percent no that totally makes sense i mean talk to me about your, your first dip into management then how was that like so you, you you're fully qualified now your first dip into black like, professional management so on, on gaining the a license the what was then the a license obviously you're then thinking well where does this take me because I, I again really at that point i, I was naive to to the systems, if you like, and 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 I applied for jobs at non-league. I remember applying for jobs at because I was in that area. I applied for jobs at Fisher Athletic and 
and clubs like that. And, and I was just getting custard pied all the time. It was like not even talking to me. You've had no experience. You had, well, how'd you get the experience? How'd you get it? So yeah. hence, hence, I kind of built up with a lot of good friends. Um, <clears throat> I built up my own club, if you like, not mine, but our club. And the pub team grew into uh, almost semi professional. So we went into the Kent League, Spartan mm -hmm. League, those kind of competitions. Uh, and we built up and, and during that time I was still running teams on the Sunday as well so I had about eight or nine mm. teams on the go with kids teams as well that I was kind of overseeing dipping in and coaching helping other guys uh, and I'd, I would you know again I made some some great friends and had some great experiences I bought uh, a ground on lease down at Blackheath wow. um, and that actually cost me my business it cost me my second marriage um because i had to go I, I actually went myself bankrupt um but again that was all about life learning and experiences for me but while i was doing that i'd obviously built up lots of relationships with players and other people and the role at tootin and mitchum came up back in uh, it was about 90 98 99 um and a player that was then playing for tootin and mitchum mentioned me to the chairman because they were struggling they were in the bottom uh of the ryman two at the time and they were really struggling. And, and he mentioned me to him, said, this guy's a really good coach. You know, no, he hasn't coached at this level yet, but he's a really good coach. He knows his stuff. I like him. The chairman kind of trusted him. So I met the chairman at a, a pub down at Surrey Docks. And we just sat and had a chat. And he went, well, do you fancy it? I said, well, I'll give it a go. Thanks. I appreciate it. Budget was minimalistic. But again, then I didn't have a clue about budgets or how to manage them. Mm. Um, so for me, it was just, this is an opportunity, a, a level up from the county leagues, et cetera, et cetera. And why have I done what I've done and got my A license here? If I don't try and use it and you need to find that stepping stone. And for me, this was a, a way to do that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I started tooting in the first year with the lads that were there. And again, I was fortunate enough to have a, a guy called Ian Hazel there. Mm -hmm. Uh, Ian was in the, the Wimbledon squad that, that beat Liverpool in the FA Cup final. He didn't play, but he was in that squad. Mm -hmm. So he'd had professional experience. He'd been at two in the year before as player, um, player coach. So mm -hmm. immediately I kept him on because I knew he'd be an asset to me and he proved to be a fantastic asset in that sense. But that first year, we saved them, if you like, from relegation. We finished around about 11th. Something like that. I, don't, I haven't checked the stats, so I'm, I'm kind of guessing a little bit. But the yeah. second year, with a similar squad, few additions, we finished 11, between 11th and 14th. And, and people were actually calling from my head then, saying, oh, he doesn't know what he's doing. He hasn't got a clue. Oh. Blah, blah, blah. So, lucky enough, the chairman really had faith in me. And he could see what we were doing in training. And he could see what we were trying to do recruitment-wise. And, and he could see it out how much time I was giving to it on no money, if you like. It was it was then the old brown envelope days and it was it was just expensive. And um by the end of that season we just let the whole team go. We let the whole squad go. And everyone questioned it, everyone panicked. And the first training session we held, we had one player there and that was a player from the season before, a lad called Jamie Pace, who was a, a Maltese international that had come in with me the year before. And um uh, he was due to go back to Malta anyway he was to, to, to play in Malta. So it, even he wasn't going to be there. And the fans had gone to watch the train and said, there's no one here. <laughs> but um, by hook or by crook, because people had heard about our training and the training sessions, mm. there was a, almost a complete team from Leatherhead that had won the, the division. And Leatherhead had had some problems. So all the players literally walked away and I got the whole team on block. Wow. Plus, plus a few more that came over. And the first training session was fantastic. And they all went, oh, where, where do we sign? When do we sign? We love this. And uh, and that's how it happened. And, and you know, the, the rest of that is history. It was a history-breaking season. Because wow. we had to play 17 games in 32 days at the end of that season. In one week, we played four games in a week. And it's just been on Twitter recently from some of the old supporters and one of the players, a guy called Mickey Roots, of how brilliant that was an achievement by that squad. Um, and I, I had two brothers, a nine and a, and a goalkeeper called Nigel and Tony Webb. And, and you know, the forward, Nigel, he, he scored some like 50 odd goals that season. And we had some real old stalwarts like Roy Jello and Conrad Kane, who, who are real 
with no names on the circuit. And and on a sad note, I had a, a lad called Neil Hams, who unfortunately died of MND a couple of years ago. He was an ex-Chelsea lad. Mm. So we had some real kind of quality and depth and a good balance of experience and some, some hungry players. And it gelled so quickly because the, the nucleus of the group knew each other. Mm. Um, the key player for me, although they were all key, was the skipper, a lad called Alex O'Brien. Mm who went on to manage himself and coach himself. He also was an extra in Dream Team and Football Factory and things like that. You know, uh, he, he was that kind of character. So he's, his first question to me before every game was, Gaffer, who's their best player? I'd say out of number eight. First tackle was Bush. Every <laughs> <game>. <laughs> He either took a yellow or he didn't, but that set the stamp for the game. But he could yeah. play as well. But that was yeah. his mentality was, right, their best player is not operating today. And, uh, yeah, it, it kind of worked. And, and the rest of the team fed off of that. Yeah. That kind of leadership. And, yeah, there was a dent in the dressing room door as well where he had, but he was like the guy off of um, Mike Bassett. He had butt the door before he went out. <laughs> so, <laughs> but off the pitch, the nicest guy you could wish to meet. Uh, so, yeah, oh, a rare trait. Don't see too many of them about these days. But, uh, no, it, it, like I said, we won the division. I, I won coach of the year. Um, we broke a load. Of, we went unbeaten, the longest unbeaten run ever. And I think we only lost one of the last couple of games because we were knackered. We were dead on our feet as a, as a team. Um, and we were surviving, you know, because we were almost living at Sandy Lane. And, and if you, I don't know if you know who Sandy Lane was the real old tooting ground. It was a sand pit. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it was, uh, but historically, um, fantastic. And the fans, you know, the bog end and, and the old... Um, Oh, what's his name? The tooting guy that was on the comedy show. That kind of, that kind of mood was there, and the atmosphere there was always great. And uh, yeah, with a bog end, Sandy Lane still rings in my head sometimes. And um, but, you know, we had a reunion a couple of years back, um, really to honour Neil, and uh, it, was, it was great to see him all. And that for me, will, it, it will take a lot to repeat that that feeling and at that level. Um, and again. A quick story. I had one board member that actually resigned on the back of because I wouldn't halfway through that season. I swear he was trying to stitch me up on the fixtures because he didn't like me. And I kind of had a row with him. And then the chairman and the rest of the board stuck with me and he went. And I remember him phoning me and telling me I had no charisma. He said, You've got no, no charisma. You've got no, no. So when we won the league, I knew he was at the game. And I, yeah. I had a t shirt printed up and it had, Who needs effing charisma? <laughs> <laughs> and I'll give it one of them, you know. <laughs> and, and, uh, yeah. So, oh, but yeah, unfortunately. That's a crazy that, story. That is a crazy story. Yeah. I mean, look, from even from potentially getting sacked for finishing mid table to then going on an amazing historic run. I mean, even before that, you were talking about you, you was bankrupt, right? Like, yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I'd, I'd kind of. My marriage had collapsed, um, um, you know, for lots of reasons. The business had struggled and I had to make myself bankrupt to protect my family. Um, so I took it all on me so that my, my, my ex-wife at that time and, and the kids were were safe. Um, and it was a reason at the time I could have gone off to the States, but I didn't go because my kids were only two and six. And, uh, and I wasn't going to leave them. So, you know... It sounds weird, but the relationship has always been solid where the kids were concerned, even from that time, which is a long, long time ago now. My son's 30. Mm. Um, my daughter's 20, 25, 26 now um, and married. So it's a long time ago. But um, yeah, it, it was a, it was a, again, a massive learning curve. And you talk about things you learn from life and mistakes. Mm. And for sure, and, and fate being a, a strange thing, without all of that happening at that time. Uh, I wouldn't have gone in back into full-time coaching because I was flitting between different roles. So without yeah. that bankruptcy happening, I probably would have still tried to apply my trade in, in the pub game or in some other way. Mm. Um, but because that happened, I went back into full-time coaching, albeit it was intermittent and voluntary, but I got back into full-time coaching and, and the coach education side of it. So fate's a funny thing, and I ended up meeting my wife now um, and we've been together 21 years now. I mean, obviously, she was a, a, a player. She was a goalkeeper um, mm. for England and then, like for me, at Charlton. Um, so, yeah, you find your soulmate in different ways. But 
Um, yeah, I've gone through some stuff. I've gone through some stuff. There's a lot more, but I'll let you ask rather than me just keep spelling. <laughs> no, no, crack on. I mean, obviously, you just mentioned there your time at Charlton where you where you met your, your wife, Pauline. Um, they went on to Millwall. But I'm, I'm curious about your time at Inasonia because I was... I was going through, I was seeing some of the pictures coming through, like this is one of them, there you go. Mm. There he is. Your time at uh, Mil- uh, yeah, Estonia. That's outside the office. <laughs> my, my office was at the stadium, that's the National Stadium, so that was my office. Yeah. That was outside on the balcony. Yeah. So, you know, I basically lived there um, in that office um, during the day um, and obviously tournaments, etc. I was in charge of... Uh, developing the game there. It wasn't just the national team. Um, so it was all the youth teams developing the game in schools. It was a technical director role as well as being head coach of all of the teams. And again, that picture there, that's from a, a course run by FIFA and UEFA. And the woman on the right behind me, she's a Belgian uh, national team coach. She was one of the coaches working for FIFA. So she would come work alongside us to deliver coach courses for the Estonian coaches because obviously their coach education level wasn't as high as it is here. Um, But they still had C licence, B licence, A licence. So FIFA and UEFA would send guest coaches to come and do clinics and workshops Mm. to try and build up the experience and prepare them to to do those badges. Um, And that's, you know, hence I ended up doing my pro licence while I was there. Obviously, I was... The only English coach on a course with uh, with Estonians and Russians, German and Dutch, uh, and a Dutch tutor. So the course was done in English for that reason, which obviously helped me. But a lot of the lectures were done in Estonian, but I had an interpreter. The girl in that picture to the right of me was my assistant coach. So oh, she could okay. speak perfect English and she translated what I couldn't understand. Right. And if you're going to ask me, did I learn Estonian? No. <laughs> um, that's going to come up on the LMA diploma soon. Yeah. Uh, and I do, I do regret not learning it. I tried, I did mm. try, but they kind of kill you on that because they they want to speak English. Yeah, okay. So they want to speak our language, but again, when you're out there, essentially, we should try and learn something different rather than just, you know, I'm English, yeah. an interpreter sort of thing. I get it. I get it. Um, I should, see, I should have learned. I mean, I learned things like colours and numbers and how to say good morning, hello, ask for a, a bill. Oh, I think you're gone, audio-wise. Audio, audio. Now, I can't hear you, I can't hear you. <laughs> Sorry, we're having some technical difficulties. Uh, what's that going on here? Apologies, folks, we're having some technical difficulties. Um, Try and sort it out in a sec. <laughs> now I can't hear you now at all. Oh, and he's gone. Um, apologies, folks. Obviously, he was just talking with Keith. Um, hopefully, he's going to go away and sort out his audio issues. But, yes, in the meantime, hopefully, you're enjoying the stream. Um, got some more things to go through as well. Obviously, Keith's been about a bit, to say the least. Obviously, he's been at Tootin when he mentions where he first got started, Charlton, Millwall, Estonia, what he was talking about. And, obviously, he's now currently at Watford and doing bits on board as well. Um, hopefully, getting back in. I hope you can hear him. You right, Keith? Still crackling. I can hear you, though. You can hear me now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know what happened there. But you're crackling to me, so I don't know why it's happening. Okay. Um, In the meantime, anyway, we've got a, a question coming from Apple. Shout out to Apple. Hang on, mate. Uh, oh, can you hear me still? I can't make you out. Oh. I restarted it. Um, yeah. Still, you're crackling on me, so I don't know why. Okay. Um, it's just... <laughs> These are live technical issues. <laughs> yeah, I can't. You can't. You can hear me clearly, but I can't hear you, I think. Oh. 
Can you hear me now? Yeah, but it's crackling. It's like you're uh, gargling while you're talking to me. Okay. There I you mean, go. you're back. You're back. Yeah. Yeah. All good. Yeah. Right. So I've got um, I've got a question in from Apple that wants to ask you as well. It says, what kind of changes would you want to see in the coach education programs? What's that big smile on your face for? Apple is Apple asking the question. <laughs> <laughs> I saw his interview the other day. I, know. <laughs> I think everyone saw his interview the other day. Shout out to Apple as well. Um, he's got another one to follow up after that as well. But let's answer this one. So, yeah, what kind of changes would you want to see the co to the coaches' education programs? To be honest, that you know, because I've been in it so long, I've seen so many changes, so so many. Um, from again the old preliminary awards through the coaching certificate, then the, the, the UEFA are kicking in, the C, the B. I think it's already in place to call what was the level two, the, the C license, which brings it into line with most of Europe. Mm. <clears throat> but for me, my, my fear factor at the moment, and it is an unknown thing, so you know, I, I, I don't know the answer to this, is that it becomes less on the grass. I actually don't. I, I'm fearful of that as much as I can see why to a point, you know, for me working on the grass with, with student coaches. And one of the plus factors was the introduction of the, the visits to go out and see guys working with their own teams. That was a big plus. Yeah. Um, but obviously again, the, the logistics of that were never easy finding the right time, right place um, for tutors. I think that still needs to be done. Um, but for me, you know, I still run CPD days and I'm obviously because I'm still with Surrey coaches as well. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I still run days in my row at Palace as well for coaches mm -hmm. to, to come and observe me too in some sessions, then have a go at some sessions, feedback to each other. Um, so I, I guess if you're saying for me that they still need to be uh, interactive and not just in front of a computer, you know, because yeah. it's not real. In whatever way you're doing this, even this, this is great. But, you know, it'd be great if we were sitting in the same room with some yeah. other guys where you can have yeah. a, a far better conversation and a, a more to the point conversation, if you like. I think for me, I just, how would I like to see him improve? Because because I've seen so many changes and this is for you, Apple. It's hard for me to say I want to see him improve because, I've seen improvements, but then I've seen it stifled and I've seen it be so different in different areas at different times. Mm. And I've worked in coach education in other countries as well, mm. where far more difficult to get your badges. So I've worked in a country where it's easier to get INA license or a pro license for, for I'm not saying massively easier, but for certain reasons, but I've also, I'm aware of countries that I visited where it could take four to five years to get your A license four to five um, years. as part of the course and, and a pro license really <clears throat> to get on that. You've got to be, you know, really, really elite and, and be lucky to get on that. And, and again, I, if you go to somewhere like Spain, you'll see they've got far more A license coaches than we have. Mm. Um, but how, what process they've gone through to get that, I, I couldn't tell you. But then you ask, why haven't we got more A licensed coaches or more B licensed coaches? At the moment, it, it would be um, certainly with the A license, again, it's the availability of courses and obviously a restriction on numbers. So, hence, you get guys from here going to looking to go to Scotland or Wales or Northern Ireland to do the badges. Sure. And, then saying, and then saying, this is a different course. It was a different way of delivering. It was a different this, different that. And UEFA have tried to make that in recent years more uniform mm. so there isn't a differentiation so i think if anything yeah it's to have more stability and more recognition and uniformity so and obviously more opportunities so the yeah. key is more opportunities for everybody to to get on it but to be really clear and i think the fa are trying to do that on you know do you as an individual need the a license where are you going to coach where where what's your pinnacle of coaching where is your expertise? It's not if you want to stay at grassroots level, and that would be nothing to be ashamed of, obviously, then do you need to put yourself through the stress of an A licence? Mm. And it is stressful. 
So I think they're trying to recognize that and help people identify it through mentoring schemes and support programs. I think they're still going to work to build on mm. where people are targeted to the right courses yeah, and with the right support mechanisms and consistent and constant support. So I'd like to see that really come into effect and play. And I, and I believe there's people within the FA now that are trying mm. to achieve that. Okay. So, you know, I'm working with, with you know, just tried to call me Peter Augustine and, uh, and Butch Fires with the FA that have really got this passion for making sure everybody gets the right support mechanisms and identifying what it is they need. So listening to people and asking them what they need and then trying to, to, to provide it. But can I guarantee that's going to happen? I, I can't. I, just, I can just hope. I don't know if that answers it, Apple. I hope it does. Well, he's, he's, he's commented afterwards. He said, couldn't agree more, but it looks like the tutor's workloads are killing them, which is ultimately sacrificing the quality of interactions. And then he's going to go on to say, we need more people like you who have hands-on experience all over the world, sitting in these decision-making and planning jobs in the EFA. I mean, obviously that's a credit to you for going out there and getting the kid. And again, what we were talking about before, you know, you've gone over to Estonia to get work. You've, you've, you're heavily involved in the women's game as well. So again, you're, you're seasoned. Do you know what I'm saying? So you need people like yourself in those roles to be making these decisions. Otherwise, it is going to be 90% behind a, a computer and 10% on the grass. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, so, oh, yeah. I, I really appreciate you saying that. And I, I don't disagree. I think, you know, you've got to go out. You have got to go out and fight for it and be prepared. I, I don't, I've said it before, I don't like this term comfort zone. I don't think... I don't think it's going out of your comfort zone. And I've said this before, I think it's expanding what your comfort zone is. Mm -hmm. So make your comfort zone bigger and don't be scared to. But to go outside it sometimes doesn't always fit. Yeah. I, I know that will make sense to people. But everyone says, oh, you've got to go outside your comfort zone. Well, why not just broaden your comfort zone? Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I mean, you, you, again, I mean, I'm... I'm I was called an old man this morning when I was doing a gym session. Uh, in, a, in an outdoor gym, by the way, not not in a... I wasn't breaking the law. Of but, course. Um, no, again, I've never turned down an opportunity to coach, whether it's voluntary or otherwise. You know, I worked a little bit for Mencat with, with Down syndrome. If a friend of mine calls me up and says, will you come and give my under-16s a, a session? Yes. Where's a window? Is there a window? Well, I've got an hour then. I'll come and do it then. Yeah, yeah. You know, mm. Can you come, come and do a session with my girls' team so I can see it? Yeah. Mm. And, and I only really say no if I can't be in two or three places at once. I'll try and find that window. And that mm. builds up relationships at all levels. Um, is it always recognised where it matters? So mm. I, I Apple suggested about me being in a decision-making role. I, you know, I've applied for those kind of roles and, and I've been uh, knocked back many, many times. And then I say I'm not going to apply again. But then when I see it, I still chuck in a CV and and, and have a go. And certainly, as, as you know from the, the soccer social event, I've applied for national team roles. Mm. Uh, the most recent ones, I've applied for a role with the PFA. I've applied for a role in Canada, uh, a role in Singapore. Now, and that's without even saying to my wife, is it OK? Um, <laughs> which is always a risk. You have to get approval but, from her, yeah? <laughs> yeah, but I haven't given up on on that pinnacle and the most recent one has been in the women's game um obviously i'm at car short and athletic yeah in, in the ithmian prem and, and the guy i work with there pete had an uh, unbelievable character for me and, and i absolutely love working with him and for me um if he doesn't achieve a higher status in the game at some point in the future um and work at a higher level as a coach or manager i'll be i'll be really really disappointed because he's got all of the attributes mm. Um, but King, before let me just cut you there. Talk to me about some of the knockbacks because, as I said, I, we met at uh, uh, soccer social, and you talked about some of the knockbacks, mainly being one of the big ones is obviously the national job. Like, how do you recover from that? Like, applying, applying, applying. People told you, you get experience. You've got experience, whether it be in this country or it be overseas. You then apply for the, the top job in in the women's game, and you're getting knockbacks, and then you're seeing someone who's, let's face it, not really that engage in the women's game get it i can say obviously you can't say it but he's not really because he'd come out and said that he was using it to kind of get a stepping stone does that does that hurt you in some way because again you're passionate about what you do do you know what i mean you're fully engrossed in it you bake in it and someone to come in and just do that how does that feel to you bro 
I guess I'm well past the stage where um, it's going to cost me a job. Um, but <laughs> obviously, professionally, I won't. I'll, I'll never um, disrespect fellow coaches mm. openly. And if I if I'm going to do that, I'd rather say it to their face mm. how I feel about that. Um, and obviously, I've met met the people you could, you, you're discussing. And, and again, I wouldn't give any kind of disrespect. You know, everyone needs those opportunities, whether it's the right person. That comes from the decision makers. And, mm. and one good thing on the LMA diploma I'm on right now, they talk about how you market yourself and and how do you affect the decision makers. Mm. So, you know, how, how better can you, can you, first of all, find out who are the real key decision makers? And then how do you reach them? How do you convince them that you're the right person uh, and get over those barriers? I'm not sure on the answer to that. How did I feel? Every time it's happened to me, it, it's, you know, I, I can only put it in the terms that it, it, it's broken my heart. Because way back in the day, when, it, when the, the opportunity first came up, when I was at Charlton and I'd been successful, um, and I applied for it the first time round, uh, and they gave it to Hope. Um, even then, you know, I, I, I get on really well with Hope now. Hope I'm getting really well. Um, she's good friends with Pauline. They play together. Um, and again, massive respect for what she's done in the game. But at the time she was appointed, she knew why she'd been appointed herself. She actually said it. Um, but she wasn't going to turn that opportunity down. And why should she? Mm -hmm. And she went on to do an, an amazing job. And yeah, we had conflicts during my time as Charlton manager over decision making on players that were selected, and, but also she she did listen as well and respected uh, and always would give me a meeting if I asked for a meeting. But at that time, Hope had not managed a team or coached the team at any level, so she was given the national team job from being a player. Wow. So that would be like Wayne Rooney now being given the England national team job, in a yeah. sense. So that made no sense to me at the time, even though I knew what their reasoning was behind it. Yeah. Um, it made no sense to me. So then it went on um, through Hope's reign uh, and my, my wife then retiring. Um, and then it went on to, to the next one, which was the reason I went to Estonia. When I was at the David Beckham Academy at the time as assistant director. It was a good job. It was a great job mm. and a great facility to work at with some fantastic programs. But I got the chance to go to Estonia because I was doing the English College's national rep site. Mm. And, and myself and a fellow coach there called Gillian Coulthard were offered this role. She was offered the role in Estonia and asked mm. me, would I go out there to support her? And again, I said, yes, great. Let's, let's go see what find out about it. Mm. And she turned it down. But if you looked at the JD for the, the England role at that time, it said, you must have a pro license. You must have international experience. Mm. or desired anyway, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, I saw that, okay, I'm going to go out to this country. I'm going to get international experience. I'm going to do my pro license if I get the chance because I can't get on it in England. Mm -hmm. um, but there might be an opportunity to do it there. And how much learning will I gain going around all these different countries and different workshops for UEFA and FIFA? How much experience can I gain that should, should then hold me in good stead if I go for this England rock? Mm. And, but then you got the vibes that they were looking for a, always going to be looking for a female head coach, which again, I've always accepted. If there's one out there good enough and experienced enough, no problem at all. But then they appointed Mark. Uh, yeah. And again, obviously Mark went on to do a, a great job and have success in the World Cup, etc. But he, he had a good background in the women's game at, at Bristol. Yeah. But he, he hadn't had the success that I'd had at that time. And he yeah. certainly didn't have the international experience or the pro license. Yeah. So then I'm looking at, you know, you're saying this on the JD and then you've gone down another route. Yeah. So, you know, people would then say I had animosity against him. It, it was never against hope. It was never against him. It was against, I, I could never understand the decisions. Yeah. But that's also knowing that, um, if you like, I had a reputation for, um, I'm not going to say outspoken because I've never been outspoken, but I've never kind of been a yes person. And, and I don't know if that, was held against me, yeah. Um, and 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 even Copy, my missus, she, she was a big, loud character. Not big, she's a good-looking woman, but she, she's a, a loud, loud character. Yeah. And, uh, and I don't know if the, the two of us together scares people or what. I don't. But, um, 
but yeah, it it, it was weird because during that time as well at the Beckham Academy, I'd taken on the Millwall role after Charlton had collapsed the team after the relegation. Yeah, again, which was another really kind of bitter time. But you know, players that I worked with through that period, male and female, so many of them have gone on to do massive things in the game. So Casey Stoney, for instance, now managing Man United women are doing a fantastic job. And for sure, will be an England manager at some stage. For Mm -hmm. sure, 100%. And and even, you know, you go down the road with Eniola Luco now, her role at Aston Villa and and what she's gone through and and come out the other side and, and the TV work, Alex Scott on the TV work. You know, you look at that, but I, I didn't work with Alex, but certainly I did with any. Mm-hmm. And um, but Farrah Williams has gone on to be the most capped international player. Yeah. Um, so many were going to be successful, and, and coaches as well. Marianne Spacey <clears throat> doing things down at Southampton. A lot of younger coaches and unknown names that are working in the game. So players and coaches that I've worked with, so many of them have, have been retained in the game, which I think is always, always the goal. Yeah, it's easy yeah. to walk away from the game, but again, I'm really proud. Even even grassroots coaches that have stayed in the game, yeah, yeah. They, they haven't walked away. They've they've held their ground. They've stood their ground. They've carried on fighting. They've carried on believing. They've carried on knowing what their priorities are. And if the priorities are coaching grassroots kids, and that's that's where their expertise is, then then without them, how does the game carry on? Yeah. You know, they are so so important. <laughs> um, but that's Can why. I- any oh. level of coach can call me or email me at any time. And I doubt, I don't know who will end up listening to this, but I doubt you'll find any coach that I've ever worked with that would say to you, yeah, I've sent him 10 emails or I've phoned him 20 times and he doesn't respond. Um, it's a real pet hate of mine not to respond. Um, whether I, I don't know the answer or not, I'll just say that I don't know it right now, but I'll try and find out. Or I've got your email, I can't answer you right now, but I'll get back to you in a day or two days. What I never do is ignore it. And if I have ignored it, it's because it's gone in junk mail or gone missing somewhere. Not because if I've seen it, I'll, I'll respond to it no matter who it is. And that can be from all over the world. Because I still get contact from from Africa, from Australia, from America, from Estonia, obviously, and even Latvia and, and Lithuania, the Baltic countries that we always regularly compete against. I made so many friends. Yeah. And and, and Turkey, one of the, the high, high up in the Turkish FA is always on Facebook chatting with me dear coach dear coach dear great coach (laughs) so it's such a massive world and it's given me so many rewards no it's never reached the pinnacle for me but it depends how you define the pinnacle if you've affected people and people's lives then you have to take that as 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 much as winning the lottery Um, and that's how i see it when i do sit and reflect i just when i feel down i just sit and think and I I do keep testimonials people send me notes whether it's one line two lines whether it's a letter whether it's an an essay or an email I actually paste and copy them all and I keep them in a folder so when I'm feeling when I'm feeling like whoa I just sit and read a few of them and go nah I'm all right. look at this look at this nah I fully hear that man that's that's great and again as you said influenced and played a part in so many people's careers and, and lives as well. So, again, those are the plus points that you've got to take from that. I mean, moving on to uh, Cushelton now, where you are now, like, how how is it being there now? Like, is it changed at all? Like, what's your role there now as well? The Carl Shorten, um, I'm listed as technical director. That, that came about because the chairman, um, again, was a former student of mine, ironically, many, many years ago. Yeah. On level two. Uh, and then he's level three. And he, he tried to get me to come back from Estonia um, probably about two years before I actually left. Mm. Um, and at that point, he was to come and work with a different manager. And when it, when the conversation then was as if I was going to be the head coach and, and, and I was looking at, do I want to come home or not? Yeah. Um, and would that be the kind of role I'd, I'd be willing to give up that international experience for? So we did have a conversation that, I'd understood the conversation to be me being <clears throat> the manager, the head coach. And at the end of the conversation, he said, yeah, and what you'll be doing, you'll be working with so-and-so. Not the current manager, it was another one. Uh, okay. <laughs> and I went, no, you're having a laugh. <laughs> 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 I'm sorry, I really appreciate the offer, but I'm not working un- under that guy. 
Uh, <laughs> what previous previous um, altercations or what? Say least. Um, or? No, not 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 personal. It's just without being horrible. I, I didn't I didn't see him as somebody I should be working under. So yeah, I knew he wasn't. I knew he wasn't qualified. I knew he wasn't qualified, and I knew he he didn't have the experience that I had. Mm. So I thought you're asking me to come in as a number two, but the conversation had been as if I was going to be the manager. Yeah. So anyway, when I came back in 2016, the chairman contacted me again and said, you know, could you consider this and, and coming in as technical director, which was a different title because they've got 40 odd youth teams down there. They've mm. got 60 odd volunteer coaches mm. Um, and he said, I really want you to meet Peter, who's the current manager, player manager. Mm. And so I went down and watched a couple of games and the way they played. And they still had Ricky Corboa and Mikel Miller playing for them then. who have obviously gone on now to, to pro clubs recently. Mm -hmm. And they were fantastic to watch the way they played. Um, and, and Pete's a big Liverpool fan. So he obviously tries to gear his style towards, uh, <laughs> towards Liverpool. But they, they played great football. And I thought, wow, yeah. And, and I looked at his demeanour and his mannerisms. because I, I take a lot from that, even people, the way people walk uh, and carry themselves. Mm. And I thought, yeah, there's something about him. I like him. Um, not in that way. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah. And so I thought, I'm going to go and say hello. So we had a chat and I'd taken some notes. Mm. And I said, I've got some notes I've taken. And he, he really, when I really appreciate it. And he was really humble, which then I gave that in return. So humility went both ways. Yeah, and uh, and he was about to start his level two at the time, so straight away it kicked in. Okay, well, can I give you some help with that? Um, I want you to have a look at it. I can send you a load of stuff, resources, and stuff that might help you. And we got him through that, but then I started coming to the game, so it started kind of slowly. Introductions, mm -hmm. um, took a few of the sessions, he still takes a good portion of the sessions, and then kind of being there on match days, and it started. And I'll still do it now. I sit in the stand in the first half. Second half, I might go down to the technical area with him. As a player manager, it kind of worked in that sense. So seeing it from higher up in the first half, making the notes from there, chatting at half time while the players had their first little moment mm. and then moving on to being in the dugout in the second half and, and helping him coach from there. And he might need to go on and play. Mm. So it being that other one. And then I brought in a, a, another colleague of mine as a goalkeeping coach, who's another A licence as well. So we kind of built up the strength in the staff uh, and the players really bought into it. And, and we've had some great lads down there. And obviously we won promotion into the Prem last year. I think we finished second in the Prem, lost in the playoffs. And at the moment we're, we're up there. Obviously COVID's kind of caused chaos. But Pete has now finished his B licence and he's in the process of being mentored to, to apply to do his A and, and that's what I'm saying about him. He he should, given the right support mechanisms, he should go on to manage, certainly for me in the Football League. Um, and if he doesn't, it'll be because he chooses not to. Yeah. Um, but he's he's got every attribute needed. His leadership skills are excellent. His game knowledge is excellent. His man management, for me, is above and beyond. He's got the balance right between caring about players and people and knowing when to be disciplined. Mm. And his his demeanour in the dressing room is quite unique. He's okay. quite unique. He's, he comes in very very quiet. Um, uh, the dressing room, Carl shulkin has got a corridor off the side of it. So if I'm sitting up there and he comes in and he sits down and the dressing room goes quiet, when he speaks, I can't hear him. So he speaks to the team. And then he says, "Keith, anything to add?" I said, well, "I didn't hear what you said, Pete." So, <laughs> so I have to get. It's not my old age, and I don't need a hearing aid yet. It's just the way he speaks. He's calm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he eye, he eyes the players. They they they're focused on him. They're fixed on him. And it's mm -hmm. the same with the youth players. You know, we've got a, a post sixteen academy there now, and yeah. they you can see how much respect they have for him, and the way that he treats kids. And and going back to to some of Apple's points the other day, you know, we've got kids from that area, Croydon area, rough right? That's tough, tough area, mm -hmm. and kids that have been chucked out of school and been given a harsh ride. But he gives them every opportunity to show that they're at minimum worth sticking with to try and get them through to our first team. Mm. 
Now, I'm, I won't lie, there's been one or two that for me have abused that. And in the end, we've had to let them go, one in particular. Yeah. Um, but we're talking about 16, 17 year olds, not so much the younger lads. Yeah. So yeah. they, you know, they should they should be at an age where they can take responsibility and, and and parents maybe need to be involved as well in those support mechanisms. But Pete is he, he cares. You know, you can see how much he cares. And and you know, even even at the end of a session where he's having a game of table tennis with him or a game of FIFA, mm. he's almost like you know, as coaches, we do become like parents at times. You know that yourself. You, you can become almost like a second parent, um, and certainly someone that's looked up to. Hence, yeah. you know what, what Apple was talking about. But I think it's it's a balancing act, and 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 it does depend on on individuals and uh, environments and everything else. Mm. But the one thing we're trying to do there is create a positive environment for them, and kind of get it right the balancing act between giving them x amount of freedom and ownership and but when to knuckle down and work uh on the pitch and, and i have to say that I, I saw i didn't work with him last year pete was doing it on his own and the improvement between the first years last year that came in to now yeah. is the top of the mountain in comparison he's done yeah. he's done great work with him and i'm really kind of proud of him for that because obviously i've been in the background little chips of advice, mentoring. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm proud of where he's at and, and I, I really do hope that he, he goes on in the future and it doesn't no matter where I end up. No, shout out to Peter and the rest of the boys down there. Just to wrap things up, man, what what would you give as advice? Like all the years of coaching, all the clubs you've been at, what sort of advice would you go, give to a young up-and-coming coach into the game or even a coach that's currently in the game kind of, midway through their career who's looking to make the next jump up because you even mentioned before setbacks not backs you've, you've looked the other way and said look you know look at the positive sort of thing so what sort of advice would you provide to those sort of coaches i think one thing that certainly uh this period of time in all of our lives has taught me is that you still got to count your blessings mm. um so however many tough times you've had there's always someone who's had tougher. Uh, so from a coaching perspective, just never, never give up on your dreams. Never. And again, it, it could just happen all of a sudden. So I, I, again, I'll give you two quick examples. A guy called uh, Eberitzi that I've been mentoring on uh, one of the FA programs. He phoned me the other day. He said, we haven't spoken since COVID because of COVID, basically. So I just want to let you know I'm out in Nigeria. And I've been appointed as a, a spokesperson and advisor onto the Nigerian FA. And wow. he's only a young lad. He's in his 20s. Wow. And he just said, I'm, I just want to really, all the advice you've given me, he said, and I felt I couldn't turn down the opportunity. He said, I'm not actually coaching, but I can have an input mm. into what the Nigerian FA are looking to do and talking about coach education, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. And I just said, wow, fair play. Well done. Fantastic. Yeah. He said, yeah, my dad's really proud of me. But So, bang, there's one example. Mm -hmm. And take it. And an older coach, who, who whoever's listening may be familiar with, a guy called Les Cleveley. So, former Dulwich Hamlet manager, former pro player, Palace, a couple of other clubs, Carl Shorten, uh, a good, uh, good under-18 coach, coached men's teams, Godalming, recently involved at Ramsgate. Great goalkeeping coach, ran his own goalkeeping goalkeeping company. Went through some hard times, mm -hmm. you know. Again, will admit himself probably made mistakes, mm -hmm. but most recent conversations is is uh, I hope you won't mind me saying he's a diabetic and he suffers really badly with it. Doesn't sleep, and you know you can have conversations with him. He's always questioning what's going on uh, with football and 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 feeling low about. All of a sudden, bang, he gets a call. He's now the national goalkeeping coach out in Bangladesh. Wow. Working with, working with Jamie Day out there. And he's on Facebook at the moment, absolutely loving life. He's working with four goalkeepers in the Bangladesh national team. He's in, I think it's Qatar at the moment, where they've got a qualifier. They played in against Nepal the other day in a national team game. But again, Les being Les, the other thing he keeps writing about is how being out in Bangladesh, he sees how people are suffering. He sees the, 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 the poorer side out there and, and he said, I'm, I'm in awe of how 
he said, I feel so humble. I'm in awe of how these people cope on a daily basis, but how friendly they are to him. So even if he walks out in the street, the people there that have nothing are smiling at him and coming up and saying hello. And you know, I saw something on here the other day, somebody walking through the park said, I, I said hello to 10 people, only one, part, one person answered me. It's crazy, isn't it? You know, there's, there's so much to do with just simple communication and a smile and a hello can mean so much. But again, back to, to the coaching perspective, never quit. Never quit. If you've got a goal or a target, uh, and every coach on the higher level workload has to do an IDP, so an individual, uh, individual development plan where they set their highest goals. And I just helped uh, the old colleague of mine, Catherine, because she's doing one of the American licenses out in New York right now. She said, what, what do I put as my goals? Well, I want to work in the college. Well, no, you want to work in the college. You want to help develop players. You want to help this. You might want to win uh, a state championship. Don't just settle for that. Look at what's realistic. You've got to be realistic. Yeah. But there, actually, there's actually no harm in having one that isn't. So, you know, I've still got a dream that I can manage a national team again. Uh, and I've still got a dream that I might get a job in the Premier League. Now, they may be impossible right now. But I can still dream that. Nothing can, no one can stop me dreaming that. Okay. If I go down to realism, if I go down to realism, then I might have to set my sights lower. But mm. the way I feel, I don't strive for the next level. I probably, I probably won't reach that one. Mm. So I think you have to strive for the level above. Yeah. Because uh, if you settle, that's where I want to go, then you don't get there. You might just kind of plateau. Exactly, and, and it, it, don't, it doesn't matter how old you are. You know, I, I am sixty-one, um, and I've been a coach for over forty years, um, but I haven't given up on the dreams. And that's the biggest message I can get: don't give up on your dreams. And remember, remember all the people during this process that you're affecting positively, and take that as your reward. Not the trophies, not the little medals that get thrown in the bin in the end. Um, the plastic trophies that just dust collect. What, what Keep the big ones, you know, like the award I got in Estonia, the gold star. I'll never throw that away because it was it was high, high level. But, you know, all the little ones you get along the way, they're probably, you're going to give them to kids. And I gave boxes of trophies to a kids club and said, please take my name off of them and just give them to the kids. They'll appreciate it more. Mm. Me, I don't need trophies. My trophies are seeing players, coaches progress and, and, and reach their targets and goals. That happens. I don't need any other trophies. No, nah, that's superb, man. Keith, thank you, man. Thank you for joining me, man. And thank you for this no conversation. Problem, man. Really appreciate it, man. And, um, I know Apple's been busy away. I haven't forgotten you, Apple, man. Don't worry. We'll have <laughs> you sometime as well. But um, thank you guys for watching and listening and I uh, hope you've enjoyed it. And yeah, listen, tell, Apple what... can call, tell Apple we can call me anytime. <laughs> right. I'm sure you will. I'm sure you will. Right, no problem. Seriously, no problem. All, All right. right. All right. Take care, All man. Right. Take care. All the best. Have a great day.